Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey everybody, welcome back to our 80s series. Today we are going to be talking about movies in 89. With us we have the usual suspects, myself, Michael, Molly, Erica. We're going to be talking about movies in the order they were released. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is a movie that asks the question, what would happen if we released a bunch of historical figures from various points in history and various locations around the globe in a 1980s Southern California shopping mall? And the answer is mayhem. This is the movie that put Keanu Reeves on the map. It is the movie that gave us phrases like party on dudes and stay excellent or no be excellent to each other it's one of those movies that i think it holds up it's wholesome and pure the whole premise of the movie is that in the far future you have this like a utopian society who lives on the philosophy of the great ones and we later learn that the great ones are bill and ted and what is their philosophy be excellent to each other. It's so present. It's omnipresent in pop culture. I will say it sounds more profound than I've always assumed it was. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't call it profound, but I would say that like, it's a nice movie. And by nice, I mean not mean. The only butt of the joke is like high school jocks or whatever. It's so prevalent in pop culture that you feel like when you see it, oh, that's where that joke came from. That's where that quote started. It's wholesome in its sort of representation of Americana pop culture in a nice, friendly, fun way. It's a movie about friendship, really. It's about yeah. two guys who are best friends, and they are such best friends that it impacts the future of humanity in this very important way. So I totally forgot something that I was going to do in this video. In several past videos, Molly has complained about having to do her makeup. So I've decided to sort of even the playing field. I'm going to do my makeup too, on video, <laughs> only using the zoom camera. And this is gonna be bad because one, I'm bad at makeup. It's two, gonna be so distracting. <laughs> two, I only have stage makeup. And three, this makeup is really old, so it might not actually be like usable. <laughs> Michael, you and I have a similar skin tone. You should have come over and gotten some of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time. This is a children's movie. Shelley Long is the head of a Girl Scout troop in Beverly Hills. It's one of those comedies where she's like thrust into it and not expecting it. And so that's kind of the joke of the whole thing. Clueless adult lady doesn't know how to handle these crazy kids, right? I still don't think it's great, <laughs> but there are some real standout moments in this movie. Her performance is pretty good. I hesitate because really, in my opinion, what takes this movie down is child actors. I'm sorry, I know that sounds harsh, I've never been a fan of child actors. A lot of the, the acting in this movie is very like hammy. And I also have always had this bias against children's movies that aren't either animated or have songs in them. If you've seen a movie in that style of comedy, you probably know exactly how it plays out, right? Like she helps them to raise all that money that they needed to raise for the, the fundraiser, even though they doubted her because, you know, she doesn't know me, I'm just a kid. <laughs> Ramin, I didn't know you hated children so much. Thought you were like a school teacher. Wow, wait till this scandal gets out. I just realized that I don't have anything to put makeup onto myself. So I might- Your fingers! I was thinking about it. Is it gonna, okay, I'll try it. Heather's is a dark comedy about murdering all the kids in your school because they're more popular than you. Winona Ryder stars um, Christian Slater alongside her. And basically she's part of a popular eight group of girls in her school who are all except for her named Heather. They are all sort of like shallow, you know, the typical popular girl tropes, right? They're pretty, they're rich, they're shallow, they are sexually active. <laughs> so she's a part of this group, but kind of also on the outside. And she meets this Christian Slater character who's a bad boy. And they sort of 
commiserate about how much they hate these popular girls who have so much clout, political, you know, popularity. It doesn't vary like, well, that escalated quickly. It goes from them complaining about what a bitch the like sort of Queen Bee Heather is to them tricking her into drinking bleach and poisoning herself to death. And then they're like, that was fun. Let's go do more murders. <laughs> With the frequency of school shootings in the last decade or two decades, you take something like Heather's, which was like sort of a dark satire at the time. And now you look at it and you go like, this actually happens. People resent their classmates and they kill them. And like it ends with the Christian Slater character like bombing the whole school down and killing himself. There's people that actually fantasize about doing that or like attempt to do that. I look at it now and I go, is this tasteful? Oh, he's going for the full purple. That's what I have. So I'm discovering that the other added challenge that I didn't anticipate with this is that everything's backwards. So Field of Dreams is a sports family drama starring Kevin Costner and James Earl Jones. As Molly would say, and I would like her to elaborate on this after I'm done, Major League, which is also from 1989, is a sports comedy, but Field of Dreams is a baseball movie. So we all know, if you build it, he will come. But this movie is wild. Kevin Costner plows part of his field to make a baseball field for some ghosts to play. James Earl Jones gets involved because the voices tell Kevin Costner that they should be friends. James Earl Jones at the end, spoilers, uh, disappears into the field slash dies like poetically. Kevin Costner reconnects with the ghost of his dead father. People from all over come to watch a bunch of ghosts play baseball. It's wild, but it's, you know, it's really about reconnecting with your past and releasing your own inner ghosts and stuff like that. But it, and also baseball. The last thing I wanted to say about this is that James Earl Jones is a treasure and he just had a Broadway theater named after him, rightfully so. That's another one that you see in all these clip shows is just having these iconic moments in it that are just, that were so present, you almost felt like you didn't need to see it. Everybody loves baseball movies. And I want to talk about why I love baseball movies. I am not athletic. I don't care for sports. I kind of like baseball because I think that baseball is theatrical. A lot of people say baseball is boring because nothing happens. But I would say that baseball is suspenseful because you're waiting for something to happen. Baseball movies as a genre are like all about achieving your highest ability and overcoming your demons in order to do that and everybody's cheering you on and everybody's on your side and you hit that home run and the music soars <laughs> <laughs> the crowd is on their feet and that is why i love baseball movies molly do you just think all baseball movies are good movies Yes. A movie about baseball is not necessarily a baseball movie by right. Molly's definition. Like we mentioned, another movie from 1989 is Major League, which is a screwball comedy about baseball players, not a baseball movie. That's as much makeup as I have, really. <laughs> so I think I'm done with this little exercise. I love Indiana Jones. Almost every role he touches, in he's Harrison Ford's just super charismatic and if I may say so incredibly sexy but this is not my favorite Indiana Jones movie by a long shot it's probably my least favorite actually I haven't seen it as often as others my favorite is the Temple of Doom but my issue with this movie is that like it's so many plots competing for the spotlight at once like I'm looking for my dad but we're also stopping the Nazis oh and the Holy Grail is a thing whereas you compare it to the Temple of Doom say what you will about Temple of Doom there are definitely some things that don't hold up like, like the way that it portrays people of color for example but everything about Temple of Doom and why I think it works as a movie is there is just one central problem. They are trapped in the Temple of Doom and it's simple and everything that happens all surrounds that one thing and therefore I as a viewer am able to like stay present with it more but in Last Crusade it's it's almost like a bunch of 
vaguely related action scenes? Um, my thoughts are going to be the exact opposite from Ramin. This one is definitely my favorite of all the Indiana Jones because I felt like there was a compelling plot, but also a compelling backstory for Indiana Jones. He wasn't just being this kind of womanizer in this one, like the, the handsome adventurer type that all the girls want to get with. Yeah, there was that element with the one girl, but there was a lot of backstory for him. There was a lot of interest in the character development between him and his father. It was a race against the clock to make sure that the the good guys you know everybody who's not a nazi could maintain this thing that might affect the entire world and get to it before they could because the nazis with unlimited life is a very scary thing hitler with unlimited life is a very scary thing so we have to get there first but we also made it very clear like from the beginning indiana jones was like i didn't come for the cup of christ i came to find my father like he was very clear about his motivations in the whole thing and then he had this whole transcendence in the course of finding the thing he had to find his faith and his belief and it's not even a christian movie it was about him believing in himself and what he was actually trying to do. I thought the action sequences went well together. I thought the character development was great because we saw some of the people coming back from previous movies to help him. And it was funny. I thought it was funnier than the other ones too. I just want to say that I am shocked and appalled that both of you had so much to say about Indiana Jones and his father without saying who his father is, <laughs> which is Sean Connery, James Bond. Come on. On! <laughs> He's a legend! And this is my favorite Indiana Jones movie also. I love the final scene, he chose poorly. Which kind of tells you that the Nazis were never gonna win to begin with. In order to find the grail, you have to understand Christ. And so the Nazis don't because they're, you know, murderous, genocidal motherfuckers. They never could have won. But also you just have that great moment of him turning into dust and then just he chose poorly, which is like one of the best lines in movie history. If it were the first movie in the series or the second, I might feel differently because it feels like too many plot hooks piled onto this character and this world at the last minute of a series. We really don't hear about his backstory before this. I mean, did they even mention his father in the previous two? I don't think so. Erica, I hear what you say about it gives him more of that fleshed out backstory, but part of what I like about Indiana Jones is, at least before this movie, the simplicity of the character. He does fill a lot of tropes, like you said, the womanizing adventurer, but in some ways he's a spin on some of those tropes because he's a womanizing adventurer, for example, who is brainy. Athletics isn't really what you think of. I mean, he does do some stunts and stuff, but that's not really the point of this series. I'm not maybe the best to lead the discussion, but I remember um, every time I've seen this or parts of it thinking, man, Robin Williams was awesome. He really does a great job pivoting between genres in a way that many other actors of his caliber don't. This movie is a prime example of that trope of the like, well-meaning teacher movie. There's been one or more every decade that releases in theaters about like, I'm gonna reach these kids, if you know your South Park. I do think that of those, that genre, which is not my favorite genre, even though I'm a teacher, maybe because I'm a teacher, uh, but of that genre, I do think this is better than quality than a lot of those movies. And I would call it a good movie. There's some really strong and specific relationships you build with each of the kids and their characters. I love Dead Poet Society. And the first time I actually saw it was in my high school English class. So that was very interesting watching it with like a bunch of high schoolers who just didn't get it there was also like a level of maturity about that movie that nobody was expecting from something with robin williams in it going to school in south florida i'm not sure how many of my colleagues had ever seen dead poet society before i just remember that because i remember watching it more again as an adult and realizing it has so much depth to it and these kids discovering themselves and coming to terms with who they are as people with the assistance of this teacher which even then you could see holy crap robin williams who's this hilarious person is a badass actor and and he did such a great job with his character really bringing out the best in these kids without being like, it's not a Robin Williams movie, right? It's Dead Poets Society and Robin Williams is in it. It wasn't strictly about him, but he just did such a marvelous job and the story was really, really compelling. Oh, Captain, my Captain, I might be the dissenting voice here. A lot of men in Dead Poets Society. It's like right. a lot of white guys being dudes. 
I mean, it was a boys' school. It's also like a rich boarding school. It's a movie about poor little rich boys, right? (laughs) I get why people like it. And I saw it also for the first time when I was in school. It was was shown in a class. And I remembered, like, really liking it and admiring it at the time. But I think now it's like a movie that's trying to be like this prestige drama. And actually, when you, like, pick it apart, you're like, is there actually that much to this or is this just a bunch of guys reading poetry i'm with molly on this one actually but something to its credit building on what ramin said and sort of going against what molly said though is that you know the whole about like reaching the kids but they're just white kids i think this actually works better than a lot Mm. of movies about like the privileged white teacher going to the inner city school and look how great this Mm. person is for being such a good teacher for this horrible job. It's like, no, that's not good. That's bad storytelling. And it's also not realistic. Usually it's because those inner city kids are wild. They're wild and out. Their behavior is so bad. Look at them. Oh my God. There are behavior problems at any kind of school. And yes, I've taught at a Title I school. I'm at a school right now that is not Title I, but close to that. Title I means it's it's basically like a a shorthand for like a school that gets funding because it needs funding. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw some extreme behavior problems like kids throwing tantrums and stuff. Sometimes there was a violent outburst, but violence happens at privileged kids' schools too. And privileged kids act shitty too in other ways and ways that frankly, I as a teacher have less tolerance for. Yeah, this might be a white privileged school, but you know, anything that gets teenage boys in a room reading poetry is okay with me. I don't think there's anything wrong with making a movie about poor little rich boys because there are ways that trauma appears at any level of society really, you know? And I think the more we do to have meaningful discussions about that, if this movie did opened that up for people, awesome. Between that and the trends we already discussed about those films being condescending in tone and stuff, it makes it clear that our society has a lot of work to do with actually humanizing people from those communities and like telling stories that are nuanced with them. The original Ghostbusters movie was super duper popular when it came out and it had this really compelling storyline. It really fleshed out a lot of their characters. And then we had Ghostbusters 2 that came out five years later. There's a lot of debate (laughs) about the, the overall quality level of this movie, but it did star the entire original cast. We had all of these people that were just so central to the comedy and movie scenes of the 1980s, very important actors playing these, these iconic characters from this series of stories that was just so ubiquitous for our 1980s childhoods, right? The Ghostbusters, they've been basically disbanded. They just fell out of favor and everybody kind of thought that they were full of crap and they were all doing their own things. And then they have to come back because basically the city gets into so much trouble they have no idea who to call. Some of the earliest examples of digital graphics, uh, really beautifully done work with Slimer and these other ghosts that were in the courtroom scene and they have to save the city and they have to save the museum and they have to save Rick Moranis again somehow. Like he was always getting into trouble. The real Ghostbusters cartoon debuted in 1986 So between that and the first movie, Ghostbusters 2 was all set to be like this huge, massive hit. And it was. A lot of people say that it was more entertaining than the first, but a lot of other people say, I hated this one. It was so stupid. I loved it. I loved both of them. I loved both of them equally. I think Ghostbusters 2 was a lot more plot driven than the first one was. The first one was really a lot of character work and getting to know who these guys were. Two was more about like this epic and fast paced story. Erica, I'm horrified that you asked the city didn't know who they were going to call. I know. I was going to say, who are you going to call? <laughs> I, I I did that with intention, Molly, but you're right that I should have actually made a point of that. Well, when, when something's wrong in the neighborhood, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically my only interaction with the Ghostbusters 1 or 2 or cartoon is high C Ecto Cooler. Oh, Michael. Yes! Yeah, there was a whole merch situation with the Ghostbusters. Herein lies another movie that, you know, is widely debated. And it's because the Batman franchise of things has been so well loved and so treasured by generations of people. Okay, so we had the 60s TV series. They did like a movie that was released for TV. This was the first time, this 1989, the original Batman with Michael Keaton was the first time that this was really going to make it to the big screen. And they gave it to, they did it with Tim Burton. For Tim Burton and Michael Keaton, this was more about the character. 
character. This was more about Bruce Wayne specifically. Everybody's talking about Batman this, Batman that, Batman. And Michael Keaton is quoted as saying, it's not about Batman. It's about Bruce Wayne. It's about the stuff that he went through in his past, why he became this vigilante warrior and why he became who he is. And they put this dark spin on it. And everybody was in on this game. Danny Elfman, this was one of his big breakout movies for writing soundtracks and movie music. Danny Elfman was part of this darkness. Jack Nicholson was such a unique and you know, iconic Joker that, uh, you know, as much as I love Heath Ledger, I don't think it's been matched since. Each Joker portrayal has been so vastly different and Jack Nicholson's was just iconic and it fit in with this idea of creating Bruce Wayne, creating Batman, creating this series of characters that was all just mashed into this one person being portrayed by Michael Keaton and who I think just did a wonderful job. Jack Nicholson is my Joker. When I picture the Joker, I picture Jack Nicholson in Joker makeup. You can see the casting because Jack Nicholson obviously is known for that smirk, that Cheshire Cat smile of his that is kind of unsettling. What brilliant casting it was to make Jack Nicholson the Joker. The thing about like any Batman story, every three or four films, we just start over and we see the whole origin story all over again. We know what the story is. Basically what you're gonna get in any different Batman movie by a different director is gonna be the tone and what's the tone that you're going for. The other thing you're gonna get is just casting. I think each of the Jokers are equally iconic because we've, we're going from Cesar Romero, who is the wacky zany Joker to Jack Nicholson. So Mark Hamill's Joker is also many people's favorite. He's, he's such an art, iconic voice actor for that role. Uh, and then we get to Heath Ledger. So I think the way to tell any of these movies apart is casting tone and just like what villains are involved. The villain that you cast, uh, that you have in your story is gonna affect the tone. So you can't talk about this movie without talking about its soundtrack, which is by Prince. And the soundtrack sold really well on its own, right? It's not in the way that many movie soundtracks do so that people can buy it so they can have that one track that's on the radio. Like people bought this soundtrack because it is a Prince album. This, uh, this soundtrack is a Prince album. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is a pretty standard sci-fi Disney family film. Rick Moranis is an inventor who accidentally shrinks his kids and the neighbor's kids. And the tiny kids have to survive the dangers of the backyard and once they get into the house and get Rick Moranis to fix them. I barely remember the movie. I have seen it all the way through. But I distinctly remember Honey, I Shrunk the Audience at Epcot. Yes, that ride was an excellent ride. I'm sure the movie is great. This is another one of those that for some reason doesn't show up on TV much. I'm going to talk about the movie because I freaking loved this movie. I watched it every chance I had when I was growing up. I loved the relationship between all the kids and all the adventure sequences of what they had to go through to survive. There were so many funny lines from the adults, like Rick Moranis' contraptions to try and find them, and the neighbor parents next door. That guy was so sarcastic with his bubbly little wife. You know, the whole movie is obviously a premise of like, what would the world look like to you if you were really, really small? And I I think that's why it lent itself so well. I'm sorry, I've got to talk about it too. To the Epcot sort of <laughs> thing. <laughs> okay, so this is a iconic, critically acclaimed movie that puts Spike Lee on the map. It is a movie about the like sort of racial tensions that rise up during a heat wave in New York City in a sort of poor, predominantly minority neighborhood. You have a white owned pizza parlor where everybody hangs out and there are tensions that build around this. The tensions build up so much that a riot breaks out. It's amazing how current it feels for something that was made so long ago because part of what happens in the movie is that there's a conflict, there is a black guy who is in a fight and the cops show up and the cops put the black guy in a chokehold and he dies from that. And then everybody is so grief stricken and horrified and they blame the owner of the pizza parlor. Eventually the lead character Mookie, who's played by Spike Lee, picks up a trash can and throws it through the window of the pizza parlor. Some interpretations are he did it to deflect violence away from the actual owner of the pizza parlor by getting everybody to trash the pizza place instead of attacking the person. And other people say that inciting a riot in response to the death of his friend, 
was the right thing to do. Right before the credits roll at the very end, there's two quotes that are displayed on the screen back to back. One is from Martin Luther King Jr. and one is from Malcolm X. And the quotes seem to contradict each other. And I'm gonna read them to you. So the first quote that is displayed is from Martin Luther King Jr. and it says, violence as a way of achieving racial justice is both impractical and immoral. It is impractical because it is a descending spiral ending in destruction for all. The old law of an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. It is immoral because it seeks to humiliate the opponent rather than win his understanding. It seeks to annihilate rather than convert. Violence is immoral because it thrives on hatred rather than love. It destroys community and makes brotherhood impossible. It leaves society in monologue rather than dialogue. Violence ends by destroying itself. It creates bitterness in the survivors and brutality in the destroyers. And the second quote from Malcolm X reads, I think there are plenty of good people in America, but there are also plenty of bad people in America. And the bad ones are the ones who seem to have all the power and be in these positions to block things that you and I need. Because this is the situation, you and I have to preserve the right to do what is necessary to bring an end to that situation. And it doesn't mean that I advocate violence, but at the same time, I am not against using violence in self-defense. I don't even call it violence when it is self-defense. I call it intelligence. And so the question that this movie Do the Right Thing is asking is, are these two things contradictory? ideas that you must respond with violence, that you have a duty to respond with violence or that violence is useless and is not going to help the situation. And the movie is very ambiguous in that way. And I think that that is part of why it is seen as such a pinnacle of cinema because there are no clear cut answers and, and it walks that line so beautifully. The critical response was kind of mixed. This is a movie that is now seen as one of the greatest movies ever. And at the time there was a lot of really racialized response to the movies. You know, one thing I'll call out is that the Chicago Tribune said um, that the movie played on white guilt and portrayed violence as a liberating symbol. And a lot of other reviewers sort of chimed in to say that they thought the movie would incite riots in urban areas. <laughs> this movie was nominated for Best Original Screenplay and Best Supporting Actor for the guy who played the owner of the pizza parlor, the white guy, <laughs> and had uh, no other nominations and no wins. And I think people saw that as a really major snub for the movie. One thing that I will say on a lighter note that I love about this movie that is iconic is Rosie Perez dancing during the opening credits. It's basically a, a plain backdrop that is, I think, a bright neon color. I don't remember, maybe it changes color. And she's just dancing in like, 1980s aerobic wear. I could watch her dance all day. <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's is a dark comedy starring Andrew McCarthy, and I didn't write down the other person's name because I didn't remember it. They show up at their boss's beach house, but he's dead, and there's some mob hijinks involved. And I know very, very few people who have actually seen it, but I so many people know the premise of these two idiots trying to convince everyone that their boss is still alive and like puppeting his dead body and stuff like that. It's talked about all the time, but I know one person who has seen it. But that's sort of exactly why I find it kind of fascinating because apparently by all accounts, it's a bad movie, but everyone knows what it is. For a lot of the movies on this list, they come from an era of filmmaking where they are the cliche sometimes because they were the first or one of the first. This is a rom-com and there were definitely rom-coms before this, but something about when Harry met Sally feels seminal as a romantic comedy. You could probably even name one or two movies that are like it before it came out. So many other romantic comedies after it feel like it. Partly because Meg Ryan is in most of those movies as well as this one. That's also one of my favorite things about this movie is her performance is so great and- Billy Crystal. He does a good job too, but I just think this movie is super charming and hilarious at times. I literally only know 
the deli orgasm I'll have what she's having scene. I'll have what she's having is like one of the funniest moments ever. It's also that moment in the context of the movie makes it even funnier because it's all about Meg Ryan like faking an orgasm, right, in a restaurant. But the way she does it is to like undercut a point he's trying to make that's a little outdated about men and women. I guess what I'm saying is it's it might seem to an outsider like it's just a, a moment where, ooh, we get sexy Meg Ryan for the gentleman in the audience. But it's actually entirely about her agency in that moment. And like, it's basically a, a long middle finger to him. The whole movie feels like it's undercutting outdated ideas of men and women. Billy Crystal's point of view from the beginning of the film is that men and women can't be friends because there's always sex in the way. That's obviously not true and obviously a bad outdated idea, but do they end up together? I don't remember. The way it plays out, if I remember, they end up together. You know what I mean? Like they are in the room together. There is still that chemistry there. The ending is very much, yeah, they probably did. You know what I mean? I feel like them ending up together having had sex sort of undercuts the point that the movie is trying to make. <laughs> I feel like to really make the point, they would just never have sex and just be friends, but then that's a boring movie. So <laughs> Nora Ephron, what was your intention? I was a little sad, Erica, that you didn't list your name as having anything to say about this movie, because I think this movie might be the perfect movie for you. It stars Tom Hanks, and a big dog, <laughs> a, a, a mastiff. It's a buddy cop movie. Uh, Tom is a detective. Tom's boss is murdered and the boss owns Hooch, the dog. Tom takes the dog in, but like Tom's uptight, tidy person and dog is big and messy. They end up working together to solve crimes and stuff like that. And it's surprisingly sad at the end, but it's it's overall, it's, it's a good like goofy comedy movie. Well, my problem with this movie is similar to the problem that I had with Never Ending Story in that one time when I was very young, I stepped in on this movie right at the very sad scene at the end, and I have never been able to go back and revisit it. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that Tom Hanks is one of my all-time favorites and I love dogs. So as we know, it's directed by John Don Bluth, stars Burt Reynolds as Charlie, Dom DeLuise as Itchy, Judith Barcy, who is Ducky from Land Before Time as the little girl, and this was her last role. But what I didn't know until I was doing the research is that the guy who wrote Bye Bye Birdie and Annie, the, the musicals, wrote the music for this movie. I watched this movie a ton as a kid. It was one of my favorites, even though it's really weird. <laughs> Everything involving the alligator is so strange. It's cute, it's sad, it's funny. Charlie, once you leave, you can never come back. I said! <laughs> when you teach pre-K to fifth grade, that's an age range from four to like 11 or 12. You really spend a lot of time thinking about the difference between those ages of what we now, most of us just refer to as little kids. But a huge number of things differ in those years of our life, our developing brains. And one of those is you often think about what movie is going to be best for the four-year-olds. And it's usually not the movie that's best for the 11 year olds. And this movie, I think I would put more in the pre-K, maybe not pre-K, it's a lot of words for pre-K, but first grade and perhaps adjacent years. Like this is to me, not just a kid movie. This is a like little kid movie. I loved this movie growing up. I maybe shouldn't have because it's, you know, it's about gambling and homeless children and death of dogs, but I always loved it. I loved the voice acting of it. I loved the story. It was one of those things that was just on repeat in our house when I was a kid. It's a very kind of messy story in some ways. Not messy like it's badly told, but messy like the story itself is kind of dark. There's a lot to digest in this. And when you get to see it as an older person, you see, wow, there's actually a lot that was happening. And that was kind of a big deal. And we didn't fully appreciate it when we were little kids, so. When you put it that way, okay, maybe third to fourth grade. <laughs> Still not a fifth grade movie. It really is a really dark movie, isn't it? And when you say messy, I think that's a really good word for it because I'm thinking about it and I'm like trying to summarize the plot in my head. I believe it's at the beginning, right? That Charlie dies and goes to heaven, to dog heaven, tricks the like gatekeeper dog of dog heaven into sneaking back to the living dog earth world, meets the orphan girl, uses the orphan girl 
what? I know that that's when the gambling comes in to like try to get money or something. I don't know even where the alligator comes in, but then like eventually, like in the end, he goes back to heaven, right? Because he dies at the end to save the girl, right? And that's how he gets back to heaven because he sacrifices himself for the little girl, which is beautiful kind of actually. And I just remember how happy the little girl was when she met the family that was like feeding her pancakes. I am fairly sure that I saw Look Who's Talking in the movie theater. I have a memory of those talking babies on the big screen. I remember thinking the talking babies were hilarious because I was five. <laughs> and what's funnier than talking babies? But let's talk about what we're really here to talk about, which is what I believe to be one of the most influential movies on my life. I think that if it wasn't for The Little Mermaid, I would not have pursued a career as a singer. Because The Little Mermaid, which is one of the first movies I ever saw in the theater, one of the earliest movies that I fell in love with, watched over and over again, had on VHS, would put the red turtleneck over the back of my head so it looked like I had red hair. This is a movie about a woman creature whose voice is so beautiful that everybody adores her for it. And literally a man falls in love with the sound of her voice. This is not healthy. <laughs> this is why I don't pursue singing anymore because I wanted to sing because I saw that movie and I thought she sings so beautifully and everybody loves her and she's adored by all and admired for her beautiful singing. I want to do that. <laughs> So it's kind of a fuck you Disney moment because like I have a lot of messed up damage about like only if I'm a good singer will people love me. <laughs> well, so this was the movie that sort of was the, the sort of jumping off point for that Disney revival in the 90s. It's obviously gorgeous, right? The opening scene with the ship and then you dive underneath and you go deeper and deeper and deeper to the land of all the fishes and the mermaids is so gorgeous. And then you have like all the fun stuff, like Sebastian the crab singing under the sea. And you have, of course, Ariel, who is like beautiful and perfect with her red hair and her like seashell bra or whatever. And, you know, who taught us that purple and green are perfect complementary colors together. And Ursula, obviously, who is, is she the best Dylan, Disney villain? I think Ursula is the best Disney villain. She's definitely my favorite Disney villain. The music is also great. Do you guys remember like all the controversies about like that one animator who like snuck in all the like dirty pictures and stuff? A route that we can go that is following along Lolly's route, but also um, slightly off to the side of it is how queer The Little Mermaid is and how it starts off with, with you know, Howard Ashman starts off this row of pretty queer Disney movies. The queer villain has been a thing forever since since the Hayes Code. You can't show a gay character when the Hayes Code was in, a, in effect unless they got what's coming to them, basically. And so they were the villains. And you couldn't say that they were queer, but you could hint at it. And so we've had queer villains throughout most of the history of cinema. What Howard Ashman did is he took a drag queen and made her this exuberant villain it's also pretty common especially among people who don't see themselves in media to agree with the villain and a lot of people think like uh, you know ursula's not wrong for a lot of the movie i mean yeah she does abuse people horribly there is a potential reading of the little mermaid in, in Ariel's story that, that you could say that that's a trans story in some way and what you have to give up to be the person you want to be and how difficult that is and how traumatizing that is. If it's what you really want, then you'll do it if you can. And hopefully you have people who support you with that. And eventually her father supports her. This whole like Disney revival era is like my whole childhood. Picture if you will, you are a little five-year-old, gay as hell, Iranian boy, and you're rewarded by your parents with a handmade note from Santa Claus. Santa Claus. It's telling you that because you learned to spell your crazy ass Iranian name correctly in English, that you get anything for Christmas. Do you know what little gay Iranian Ramin asked for? The motherfucking 
Little Mermaid doll whose fin changed in the water, changed color. I remember that. And I got it. I do love this movie. I think it deserves all of its reputation and praise. The real kicker for me for the music in this movie is the orchestration. The orchestration in the score is excellent. I turned seven in 1989, so I was peak target for this. My grandfather sent us the little Christmas ornaments that McDonald's sold. There's a little flounder and little Sebastian in, in stuffed form, and they were on our tree for years. I love this movie, and I love how much it represents Disney's renaissance. There was a lot of talk about how these feature-length films were not going to be able to continue if this one flopped, because they hadn't had one that was a real commercial success in over a decade or something, and there was going to be a lot of change changes at Disney if this one didn't sail. So they needed to, <laughs> I didn't even say that on purpose, um, but it was going to be this big moment and a big test. They passed with flying colors. It was, the, it was the time when Disney came into this new era of filmmaking, of film techniques, musical scores, acting, like all of these elements of these feature length films just really clicked into place with this. It started the trend that has carried them to today. I wanted to sort of build on what Erica was saying, because I think it's really important that like how this movie was for Disney. And it's it was really Howard Ashman's doing. <laughs> Howard Ashman as the producer and lyricist of this um, with music by Alan Menken. Ashman had the idea to structure this film, this Disney film, like a Broadway musical. And before that, even though many of the Disney movies had music, they weren't really structured like a musical. Don't set anything as your life's pursuit just because you think it'll make people love you. I don't recommend it. By the way, I love Ursula, but Maleficent is number one. Yeah, I, and I agree with you. <laughs> Ursula is a close second. Yeah. Close second. So it's a comedy drama starring a lot of big names. Sally Field, Dolly Parton, Olympia Dukakis, Shirley MacLaine, Julia Roberts. There's something about the chemistry between the actresses in this movie. It's just undeniable and it's almost... It's almost mesmerizing the way that every scene, like it feels like you are getting a glimpse into these friends' lives. Everyone's performance in it is strong. The way that these actresses navigate comedy and like the, there are some heavy moments in this. Sally Field's moment when she has her breakdown is just like, I to this day cannot watch that whole sequence without crying. Okay, Driving Miss Daisy is just, epic and beautiful and a wonderfully done movie. It was based on the play that had just come out a couple of years before it. The play was like mid 80s and this is 1989, so not a lot of separation there. But it was so popular in its form as a play that it went to to movie them quite quickly. It was directed by Bruce Barraford, a uh, score by Hans Zimmer, and it was starring Jessica Tandy and Morgan Freeman and Dan Aykroyd. This was a big year for Dan Aykroyd. And also Patti LuPone, which I had completely forgotten that Patti LuPone played uh, Dan Aykroyd's wife in this movie. So it's about an older woman who is uh, getting into these years where she can't quite live on her own. She needs a little bit of help. So her son, Dan Aykroyd, hires a driver to drive her around. The difficulties with it is that they're living in the South at a time where she's one of these, I don't have a racist bone in my body kind of persons, you know, that they just don't realize their privilege and their biases. An important part of the story is her coming to terms with her own kind of racist background, but realizing that every person is just a person and that any preconceptions that she had about him or about any group of people generally is all kind of BS because we're all human beings. And the most beautiful thing about it is that it's the development of a friendship in, in a way that is not in any way based in, in romance or any kind of trauma, unless you count the, just the kind of adversary serial difficulties they had with each other and he didn't have them she totally had them so there was a lot for them both to get around but every aspect of this movie was just beautifully shot the story was perfect the, the script was ideal and it shows us a side of humanity that is about developing our humanity and developing our friendship even into our later years and to just face that for what it is even though the sort of racial tropes are kind of played out I love Driving Miss Daisy. I love Morgan Freeman in Driving Miss Daisy. I love that it takes place in Georgia. I love that it was mostly filmed in Atlanta. And if you are familiar with Atlanta, you can actually like recognize like the street that they're driving up and down where her house is. I love that so much of the movie revolves around going to the Piggly Wiggly, <laughs> which is a real grocery store in Georgia. It is called Piggly Wiggly because that's how they do things in Georgia. 
another Morgan Freeman movie. Glory is the true story of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry during the Civil War, which was one of the first all colored was the term they would have used back then regiment in the union army i want to quote roger ebert here in his review of the movie he said i didn't understand why it had to be told from the point of view of the 54th white commanding officer why did we see black troops through his eyes instead of seeing him through theirs why does top billing in this movie go to a white actor? The white actor in question being Matthew Broderick. This movie got, you know, critical acclaim. If you like war movies and Civil War movies, it is very well done. I haven't seen this movie. The only thing I have to add is that I can't imagine Matthew Broderick in a war movie. So to Ramin, who was best actor in the 1990 Oscars. I feel like Robin Williams hadn't yet. I don't think this was his Oscar. Don't think Morgan Freeman, even though I wish it were. Um, I'm gonna go with Kenneth Branagh. No, Molly. Morgan Freeman. No, Erica. Oh, Daniel Day, Daniel Day Lewis. Yes, it was Daniel Day Lewis. Damn it, I was gonna guess that. One. I'm gonna give you guys a little tip. It's always Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did get nominated, but he didn't win. Jessica Tandy won. Well, Erica. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ramin, next question. Who won Best Actress? Fuck me. Um, God, I don't know. I guess I don't know movies like I thought I did this year. Um, I mean, I've never seen any of these, so I'm going to just go with Jessica Tandy. <laughs> yeah, Erica just said that. Okay, Molly. What won Wait, Best Picture? These are not the nominees I expected. Of course, we know that Do the Right Thing was not nominated. I don't think it's Driving Miss Daisy. Why? Does my heart want me to say Field of Dreams, even though I feel like that's really wrong? <laughs> I'm going to go with Field of Dreams. No, Erica? It's Driving Miss Daisy. It is Driving Miss Daisy. Oh. And you know, I read a bit of trivia. This is the most recent PG rated movie to win Best Picture. Everything else has been PG 13 or more. Ramin, what do you think from the list on the screen was in highest grossing? I'm going to go with The Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid. It's number nine. Ramin gets two points. Molly. Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters was number eight. Molly gets three points. Erica. Batman. Batman was number two. Erica gets nine points. Ramin. Back to the Future, part deux. Back to the Future, part deux was number three. Woo! Ramin gets eight points. Finally doing good at one of these. Okay. <laughs> you know what I have to say if this is a wrong answer. Or you know what you have to say if this is the wrong answer. And if you don't, I'll be very disappointed in you. My guess is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. But what I have to say if that's the wrong answer? <laughs> if it's the wrong answer, it's she chose oh, poorly. Got it. <laughs> well, it was number one. But now you can say she chose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> Erica. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. No. Erica's first error? Ramin. Um, has anyone guessed Driving Miss Daisy yet? No. And that's my guess. And that is a no. Ramin's first error? Molly. Field of Dreams. Everybody loves baseball movies. Not enough to be one of the top grossing. Erica. Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery was not one. Second error for Erica? Ramin. Glory. No. Ramin's second error? Molly. Lethal Weapon 2! Lethal Weapon 2 was number six. Molly gets five points. Erica. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So I was thinking it would be that, but no, surprisingly not. So Erica is out onto Ramin. I don't believe All Dogs Go to Heaven has been guests. Is that right? It has not. Okay, that's my guess. That's a no. We're on to Boom. Molly's got two chances to pass Erica. I don't know. I could be right, or I could be really wrong. I may but I would be right. Say weekend at Bernie. No. Last chance, Molly. You get to go again. Oh, I get to go again. Honey, I shrunk the kids. Honey, I shrunk the kids. Yeah. Number She's seven. Still in the game. Molly gets four points. You get to go again. No, nobody gets Star Trek. Star Trek. No. Number four was. Look who's talking. <laughs> in the theater. I was part of that <laughs> statistic. 
Number five was Dead Poets Society. Really? And number 10 was Born on the 4th of July. Okay, so now we'll do Ranker, which is people on the internet voting on what they like. Erica. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. That was number one. Erica gets 10 points. Ramin. Driving Miss Daisy. Driving Miss Daisy is not on the list. Molly. Do the right thing. Do the right thing is not on the list. Erica. Wow. Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted is not on the list. Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid is number five. Ramin got six points. On to Molly. Heathers. Heathers is not on this list. Motherfuck. Erica. Ghostbusters 2. Ghostbusters 2 is not on this list. Ramin. I'm going to go with When Harry Met Sally. Surprisingly not on the list. Who are these people <laughs> ranking these movies? I love that Molly is more incensed over my answer being wrong than I am. Molly. Batman. <laughs> Batman. It's number three. They're a bunch of dudes. They're a bunch of white dudes. <laughs> Everybody loves baseball movies. Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams was number 10. One point for Erica. For me. Dead Poet Society. Uh, no, it's not on this list. Damn. Am I out? Oh, yeah, Ramin's out. Say anything. Say anything. I'm out. It's a no. Yeah, Molly's out. Erica. Last shot. Uh, honey, I shrunk the kids. Um, no, that's a no. Yeah, we didn't do so well on this list. Okay, so number two was National Lampoon. Christmas Vacation. Christmas number, movies always rank high. Number four. Major, Major League. Major League. Not it as good as a bunch, bunch of dudes. dudes. <laughs> it number is a six. bunch of dudes, except for like the one girl that voted for Little Mermaid. <laughs> number six was The Abyss. Number seven was Uncle Buck. Number eight, Back to the Future Part Two. I was gonna guess Back to part the Future. Part two is not a good Back to the Future movie. <laughs> no, it's not. But it's and... got cars. <laughs> got a car. And number nine, <laughs> Lethal Weapon Two. Christ. But really, if you look at like grossing, it's they're fairly similar lists. This list put Back to the Future Part Two over. I mean, Driving Miss Daisy over. Do the right, like, sorry. Sorry, yeah. internet, we love you. Give us your sweet views. <laughs> this isn't even like film nerds because film nerds would have put do the right thing on the list, right? This is just nerds. Okay, so that's it for the games for this one. Um, our winners are a tie because it's a tie between Erica and Molly this time. Any general thoughts on movies in 1989? I mean, I think we're getting into like a period where for our generation, at least, like these are movies that we know and love and remember. We're starting to get to where we, even though we were very young at the time, we were participating in the consumer economy for movies. A lot of these movies, like maybe three or four years later, started to be in syndication on TV. They were becoming beloved favorites of ours. So I think that we're going to see that the four of us are going to start to look at these movies you know, in a different way because they're going to be more familiar to us. But I also think it's always kind of surprising what the highest grossing films are. It does not mean best. A lot of the things that do make a lot of money, it's sequels make mm -hmm. a lot of money. Things that have a lot of people in the cast that people know mm -hmm. will go to see films when they know people in the cast um, or when it's a sequel to something that they're already familiar with. People like familiarity. The highest grossing is always an inter an interesting game for me too, because clearly Driving Miss Daisy, it did gross well. It did well in the box office, but it came out in December. So that's why it's not on this list. Mm. That's just interesting to me. Yeah, that, and that's why I included dates of release for all these this time. I think this ranker listing is more shocking than many of the other ones that we've looked at. Thank you so much for joining us for this video. Please give this video a like um please subscribe if you haven't uh please give me makeup tips and <laughs> and yeah maintain your groovy selves we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Oh, wait before that next one so the next video which i'm guessing will come in three or four weeks will be video games of 1989 which molly will be sitting out of because she hates fun she hates participating in fun she likes observing like to observe it from a <laughs> <laughs> look for that in three or four weeks once the 
three of us have time to talk about it. So now we can say, maintain your groovy selves and see y'all soon. Be excellent to each other. Bye.